It's like those journalists who jumped on the story did it either badly, you know, because they were incompetent, or they did it maliciously. Right. And that, and and so now we could say, let's say things go really badly in the next year. Well, then each of those journalists might be able to sit at home and say, hey, I played a causal role in bringing about this state of murderous collapse because of my little ethical, my ethical lapse when I was covering the James Damore memo, you know, because of my own laziness and ideological rigidity. I was willing to play fast and loose with the truth, and now I've played a major causal role in, you know, pushing everything towards a state of chaos. It's like people had better be on their toes because we're in a situation that's radically unstable. You have been brainwashed. You didn't even know it was happening. And in many cases, you willingly accepted it. And that thought right there, telling you I'm wrong? Well, perhaps you don't realize how deeply societies have been affected by the fall and diaspora of the Soviet Union and spread of postmodernism. But don't fret. You're strong enough to overcome it. Leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in a country like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia. And we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninism. That is my former colleague. I realize the subtitles say Thomas Schumann, but that's merely an alias. This man is former KGB and defected to the United States and then Canada to tell the world what real espionage is. And in the process, he predicted rather perfectly the events that we are seeing today. Okay, law and order now also is uh, pushed into the area where previously people settled their differences uh, peacefully and legitimately. Now, we are getting with this, uh, uh, court cases in the, in the smallest irrelevant cases. We cannot solve our problems anymore. The society at large becomes more and more antagonistic between individuals, between groups of individuals and the society at large. The media puts himself in the opposition to the society in general, at large, separate, alienated. In his lectures, he describes the machinations of the KGB and how socialists destabilize other nations. But with the fall of the Soviet Union, the children of that permanent revolution can be found at all corners of the globe. And their ideological children in fights on the streets of the United States nearly every weekend now. Not to say that the Soviet Union or KJB had any direct influence or interactions with these people. No, they've merely clung to a toxic ideology for whatever reason in times of crisis. No more compromise. Fight, fight, fight. The normal, traditionally accepted relations are destabilized. The relations between teachers and students in schools and colleges fight. The, the relations between, in economical sphere, between uh, laborers and, and employers are further uh, radicalized. No more acceptance of the legitimacy of demands of workers. You see, the problem isn't that postmodernist Soviet ideals came here after the fall of the Soviet Union but rather that they had been here already for some time. It's so benign in nature. The erosion of work programs for the homeless or destitute within so social programs. The focus on equality rather than merit, accomplishment, and competition, to the point where some people are more equal than others and everyone gets a trophy. The constant influx of culturally destabilizing propaganda from nations like China in our movie theaters and on our televisions. The communist sympathetic educators and the giant gaps in historical education filled by courses like sex ed and home ec, things that should be taught in the home as part of the culture and history of a people and is instead sterilized and centrally controlled. 
and socialist ma lawmakers who take that education, that destruction of their ability to reason, into a position of power. Okay. On that stage, you remember I was talking uh, a, a couple of hours ago about the sleepers. That's when the students from, say, United States, if they are trained in, in Lumumba University, or developing nations, that's the students I was dealing with, are being sent back from the Soviet Union here. Or if they were already in the United States, in the country, which is the object of, of subversion, they spring to action. The sleepers go up. They slept for 15 to 20 years. Now they become leaders of groups, preachers, uh, I don't know, public, public figures. Prominently, they act in, they actively include themselves in a political process. Makes you think the blue checks and the so-called journalists out there, doesn't it? But it's not just public figures. Teachers and universities, unelected committees, social workers and foreign lobbyists, masses of ideologically charged people, the self-appointed rulers of your opinion who say they know how to run a society, all violently or coercively demanding the change they see as the only option through their ideological lens, and further deepening the crisis they would wish to avoid. When the Greyhound uh, network was on strike recently, the correspondents of local TV networks uh, all over the United States were approaching these strikers and they say, oh yes, we are doing something nice. They look like heroes and they were proud. There was some family, uh, the husband was a uh, bus driver. Now they decided in, 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 in the protest against the uh, uh, bosses to camp somewhere in the forest. And they were presented to the, to the audience as, as a heroic, nice people, you see? The violent clashes between passengers, picketers, and, and the strikers are presented as something normal. 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would, we would, be, uh, we would be angry, say, why, why, why so much hatred? Today we are not. We say, well, it's commonplace. Radicalization, militarization sometimes. As I explained uh, on that stage, I, I took a step a little bit further. But why? Why are these ideals so un-American in nature, so violent and dangerous, also so welcome to the children and young adults of America, regardless of political affiliation? Why is it that Nazism could be considered so much worse than communism and socialism, when they are both all ideologies which have only ended in mass murder? This is a question Dr. Peterson has been dealing with for quite some time now. They, they were united under the banner of the hammer and sickle and were calling for revolution. And what was so interesting about that, and I really mean technically that it was interesting, was that the mainstream media said virtually nothing about the fact that these let's call them counter protesters i don't know exactly how you'd term them had come out under this murderous symbol and that's made me think like i can't figure out why the swastika is an immediate identifier of a pathological personality and the hammer and sickle isn't there's actually a reason it isn't just arbitrary uh, and i think maybe it's something like the Nazi is the guy who knifes you in the alley and steals your wallet, and the communist is the white-collar criminal who, t who takes your pension. And you're actually more afraid of the first person than the second person because the damage they do is more proximal and, em and emotionally recognizable. But it runs so much deeper than that. It's not that the hammer and sickle is more trustworthy up front, but rather that we have, as a world, been educated to see that a hammer and sickle as a symbol of the people when it is really a symbol of a centralized, authoritarian government that couldn't care less about its people if it tried. The alt-right and Antifa both are useful idiots, educated and brought up by this socialist-infected system, regardless of the parts they accept and the parts they so vehemently reject. But they're not the only ones. After all, we went to school with them. We shop at the same malls and watch the same television as them. We have shared this nation right up until the point at which we all decided we couldn't. 
but it's not all we have. Dr. Brett Weinstein, evolutionary biologist at Evergreen University, spells it out better than I ever could. First of all, there's a lot we can do. And sure. in fact, you know, one of the other things about, about the evolutionary toolkit is that I believe we have exactly the tools for navigating this puzzle. They're built into us also, in addition to this latent program. Um, but we are now in a very dangerous situation because, for example, uh, if Google and other of these online Goliaths start uh, deploying algorithms that decide what we get to talk about and see, then we cannot use the very tools that are necessary in order to escape um, and avoid something like civil war, which frankly... Open I, communication and debate, analyzing all the components of this issue completely objectively. Exactly. Yes, and taking the risks that are necessary with that, and some of the risks are that if we have free and open communication, that some percentage of that communication is going to be reprehensible and deplorable. But that, yes. but that, but that the consequences of suppressing that are so much more dangerous than the consequences of allowing it, that they're not in the same universe. None of these conversations will be easy. None of them will even be possible if we don't observe ourselves. Not look inside or meditate or any other external philosophy. Just being honest with yourself about how you behave and recognizing where your actions contribute to destabilization, division, ostracization within groups of friends, within families, within states and nations. This idea that's emerged in the West that consciousness is the mediator between chaos and order and the, and the, and the generating, the phenomena that generates experience and that, and that you can think about that as, as, a, as a divine category of, of existence. And I've been trying to delineate how, how the biblical stories lay out the pathway by which the divine individual should manifest him or herself in time, because that is what it is. And, I, and I, I've, I've, I've been studying, for example, the Abrahamic stories, which I didn't know well. And the Abrahamic stories are really interesting. I mean, Abraham is called by God. And when Abraham is called by God, he's old. He's like one of these guys who's 40 years old and has stayed in his mother's basement. That's, that's Abraham. It's a little late for Abraham to be getting the hell out there in the world. And God basically says to him, leave your family and your friends and your place of comfort and journey into the land of the stranger. That's the call to adventure. And as always, Dr. Jordan Peterson says it so beautifully. Like a romanticist who loves knowledge and wisdom rather than eschews it. And it goes to a greater subject of Dr. Peterson's interests. The Hero's Journey. The Hero's Journey is repeated throughout religion and philosophy and fiction in so many varieties of ways, but it always meets specific narrative points. The Call to Adventure. Refusing the Call. Divine Intervention. Crossing into the Belly of the Whale. The Trials and Tribulations. Atonement and Apotheosis. And finally, the Return Home to Share what has been learned. It's just as easily misused and misunderstood as it is used and understood. And it can be so easy to lie to yourself that you're on such a journey. But only by crossing that threshold out of your comfort zone and into the challenges and temptations of life, by failing and falling into that abyss, only to find yourself reborn and renewed within a few days, it's the only way you'll ever be able to see what you're truly capable of when left only to yourself. And trust me, you're capable of quite a lot. And you can call me a hypocrite. You can call me a number of things. But it doesn't really matter if you do. If I fuck up here, and again, when I fuck up, it's always huge. But even when I try to flee to comfort, that comfort will never suffice. The only choice in this time of crisis is to challenge oneself and discover just how strong you really are. To overcome the cognitive dissonance you've created in your mind between what you know is true and what you have been convinced is true. Otherwise, you're just another useful idiot. Uh, the KGB was even curious about this gentleman. It may look innocent. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, a great spiritual leader, or maybe a great charlatan and crook, depending on which, from which side you're looking at him. 
Uh, Beatles were trained at his ashram in Hardwar in India how to meditate. Mia Farrow and, and other uh, useful idiots from Hollywood visited his um, school and they returned back to the United States absolutely zonked out of their minds with marijuana, hashish and crazy ideas of meditation. To meditate, in other words, to isolate oneself from the current social and political issues of your own country to get into your own bubble, to forget about troubles of the world. Obviously, KGB was very fascinated with such a beautiful school, such a, a brainwashing center for stupid Americans. I was dispatched by the KGB to check what kind of VIP Americans attend this school. That's you on the left. Yes, I'm on the left. I, 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 I was trying to get enrolled in that school. Unfortunately, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi asked too much. He wanted 500 American dollars for enrollment. But my function was not actually to get enrolled in the school. My function was to discover what kind of people from the United States attend this school. And we discovered that, yes, there are some influential members of family, uh, uh, public opinion makers of the United States, who come back with the crazy stories about Indian philosophy. Indians themselves look up upon them as idiots, useful idiots. To say nothing about KGB, who looked at them as, as, as extremely naive, misguided people. Obviously, a VIP, say a wife of, of, of a congressman or, or a prominent Hollywood personality, after, the, after being trained in that school, is much more instrumental in the hands of, of manipulators of public opinion and KGB than a normal person who, who understands, who, who looks through this, this, uh, this this type of, of uh, fake religious training. Why would they be more susceptible to manipulation? I just mentioned that because, you see, a, a person who is too much involved in, 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 in introspective meditation, you see, if you carefully look what, what Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is teaching to, to Americans, is that all, most of the problems, most of the burning issues of today can be solved simply by meditating. Don't, don't, don't rock the boat, don't get involved. Just sit down, look at your navel and meditate. And the things, due to some strange logic, due to cosmic vibration, will, will, will settle down by themselves. This is exactly what the KGB and Marxist-Leninist propaganda wants from Americans, to distract their uh, opinion, uh, attention, and mental energy from real issues of the United States into a non-issues, into a non-world, non-existent, uh, harmony. Obviously, it's more beneficial for the Soviet aggressors to have a bunch of duped Americans than Americans who are self-conscious, healthy, uh, physically fit, and alert to, to the reality. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi obviously is not on the payroll of the KGB, but w whether he knows it or not, he contributes greatly to demoralization of American society. And he's not the only one. There are hundreds of those gurus who come to, you, to your country to capitalize on naivete and stupidity of, of Americans. It's a 